but I'm going to come back to uh, in a minute. But Paul, what are you? What's your thought? Well, I wanted to go to uh, <coughs> what Kathy said said earlier about reality and about uh, how we're going to deal with so much coal in our generation mix. Well, let me just point out to Kathy; she may not be aware of this, that Ontario, Canada, closed all its coal-fired power plants, 25 percent of their supply within 10 years. And Ontario is the industrial heart of Canada. They made a policy decision to close their coal plants. A party ran on that platform. They won. And unlike a lot of politicians, they actually delivered on their campaign promises and closed those coal plants ahead of schedule within 10 years. And going back to the, uh, the laudatory description of our cap and trade program, there is another mechanism for limiting carbon emissions and that's a carbon tax. And you mentioned Quebec, but let me point out to you that in Alberta, Canada, they are proposing a carbon tax. And for those of you who don't know, uh, in Alberta, they call Texas the Alberta of the South. And that's a province that has been conservatively ruled for almost 50 years. And that government that's recently been elected there has proposed to close, yes, all its coal-fired power plants. Alberta. That shows you when you have the political will, you can do things. And so we need the political will, and I want to follow up with what Todd said, and also Dean. That what's happening with electric vehicles is happening both because the technology is advancing at a very rapid pace, as, as, as Todd mentioned, when we look for these things are coming much, much faster than even people like myself, who's an advocate of electric vehicles, of wind and solar panels, for example. They're happening faster than I can estimate. When I started my career, I was saying, if we ever got wind energy to 10% of supply, wow, that would be terrific. We probably can't go more than 10%. Within 10 years in my career, I said 20%. We could never do more than 20%. The world would come to an end beyond 20%. Then we reached 30%. I said, well, maybe 50% is OK. And then we're approached. We've got 50%. So now we say we can do so much more. Part of our limitation is our limitation of vision of what we can and cannot do. And unfortunately, we in America and here in California have fallen back in, in backbiting and political discourse that doesn't advance us to where we really need to go. If we're going to address clean air issues in this valley, if we're going to meet our climate change targets, because they are important, whether we're 1% of the supply of carbon emissions in the world or not, we have to do it if we want to be leaders or if we want to be followers. That's a choice we can all make, of course. And I would say that of the people here, I know four people who drove to this event in electric cars. That's four, four people in Bakersfield who drove here in an electric car in 2016. I didn't think that was going to happen, but here we are. And one of the things that's going to make electric cars successful is just drive one. It's fun. It puts fun back in driving. Turn off that eco mode and put your pedal to the metal and you will go. And that's what's going to sell electric cars. Thank you. Um, so Todd, I did want to come back to the 50% goal and that it is, is now law. We're going to have to adopt it by 2030 and uh, what that means. Um, you know, and I, I want to follow up on a theme that we're going towards here, you know, just the, the rapid change. And I was going to get to, I, I want to get questions to the audience pretty soon, but um, how does that rapid change look to average people? You know, what does it mean in terms of cost? What does it mean in terms of my lifestyle? You know. Um, but if you could speak to that in terms of what it means for the 50% renewables, too. Sure. And so right now, uh, PG&E is able to provide our customers uh, with electricity 30% renewable. We'll be well on target to get past 33% by 2020. Uh, we'll probably be about 37% current projection. 50% by 2030 looks real challenging, but looks doable as long as we don't say exactly how we have to get there today, as long as we can just along the way, as long as we can learn. Ten years ago, solar P photovoltaic panels, no way would they be a significant part of the mix. They just seemed too expensive. Cost of about 
one fourth now of the projections from 10 years ago. And so if I had to say today what the mix would be in 2030, that's a losing proposition. We need to adjust along the way. We need to think about wider integration regionally. We need to think about interesting breakthroughs in storage technologies to enable more renewables. I appreciate you mentioned uh, Denmark, uh, Paul. Of course, they rely greatly on the hydro in Scandinavia to work, mm -hmm. and Germany relies on France and Poland to help integrate their renewables. Um, in California, we rely... Well, the Germans do <laughs> export electricity to the France, that is correct. <laughs> and, and so, uh, in California, we're gonna, we rely uh, on a variety of storage technologies. Uh, we're looking state law, California policy, to transform the energy storage market. And if we get transformation there, the way we've gotten in uh, solar PV breakthroughs in cost, it may cost far less than the projections. But we don't know, and we need to take it a step at a time. One thing I can tell you for sure, California policy is going to change. Because if you look to see since 2002, Dean, every two years the legislature's passed additional renewable laws. And Gene, but I wasn't uh, one of them, by the way. I, I, I appreciate that. I look to see what the laws were going to be in 2018 or 2024. The one thing I know is they'll be different from what they are today. So our target, even for 2030, is likely to adjust along the way. And if it costs too much, we need to think about a different way to get those greenhouse gas reductions. And if it doesn't cost as much as we think, or it looks like there's some real breakthroughs, we should pedal to the metal there. I, lo I love my friends at the utility. <laughs> they have a guaranteed rate of return. We are not that. If we were that, we wouldn't be laying off people at $30 a barrel. Okay, so, so it is um, a, a, an interesting um, conversation relative to the utilities versus how others have to deal with these issues in the state. Mm -hmm. And I would say to, to my friend Paul, now I know why we're at different sides of the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting hard. For, for one, I'm so happy to hear that Paul supports the renaissance of natural gas so that we can have the cleanest burning fossil fuel to deal our, with our electricity, which California has done for, for, from the beginning of time. So it's great, great to hear that we support that. And for our industry, we, we, we have no issue with carbon tax or cap and trade. For those in the audience, there are two mechanisms that do the same thing. They are both market mechanisms. And whether you pick one or the other, my association's actually split. Half of my members like carbon tax and half of my members like cap and trade. California picked cap and trade, so we're in that one. But the carbon tax up in, in, uh, in Canada is actually very, very successful. It's very transparent, sends a direct price signal. It's not complicated. Cap and trade is complicated, and it's not as transparent. Mm -hmm. But they both achieve the same things. Carbon tax, you know the price. You're not quite sure about the emission reductions you get. Cap and trade, you know the emission reductions, and you're not quite sure of the cost. So actually, you know, Paul, we actually agree on a couple things. Oh, yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Senator Fuller, I'd like to ask you. What I, I would, would point out that electric ve vehicles are far quieter than gases. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously don't like NASCAR. <laughs> <laughs> um, Senator Fuller, Fuller, when we're talking about rapid change through these policies, how do you think that looks in Bakersfield? What does it mean for people in Bakersfield? Well, I think that's a really good question. Let me just let me just start out and say, okay. My job when I first started teaching was the technology director, and I had more fun <laughs> calling all the companies of all the places and getting innovation and bringing it to the schools before it was cost effective for us ever to buy it, and because companies were willing to donate it, and I was the one that figured out how to make it run when nobody else could because there wasn't a manual, and I love that. So let's, let's just don't get into that Gene Fuller is like against change and never think it's going to happen because if you look at my history, you are going to find yourself in very shaky ground. My whole point tonight really is that as, as an administrator, I had a finite pot of money that I wanted to use for the best value for my children. I wanted them to have what every other kid in every other district and all those other cities that could afford to have really rich people give them donations and grants for computers and things. I wanted my kids to have that. 
So in order to do that, I had to pinch the pennies, I had to ask parents to help, and I had to figure out how we got donations and how we get there. I haven't changed at all. All of you that know me know that my biggest problem is I don't have a good filter because I will just tell you what I think the common sense solution is, and I will tell you that honestly no matter how many times you talk to me, but I will research it to the end because I, loved, I love being a scholar. So what do I think about technology? I think the market is going to drive the most exciting technology ever, and I wish I could live another 100 years <laughs> so I could see it. But my experience in politics has made me find that politics is often driven by winners and losers being created by people who want to make money off the system. And that people in areas who maybe don't have the numbers suffer, suffer. And I just, I just think that like, hey, you're going to see me driving a hybrid. I probably do and don't even know it right now. I mean, you know, these things, <laughs> it's incredible what the cars they're making these days. And you are going to see all of us changing. But this stupid debate, and I sort of go back to, to, to what you said in the beginning, the stupid debate over are we, are we making our goals or not, and is it important or not, it really doesn't matter. Like France, yeah, they're making goals. And just because we love their people and the way they dress and their food, uh, like, do we think that they should lead in technology? And oh, by the way, a big part of their portfolio is nuclear. Like a, a, more than renewables is nuclear. They count it as renewable. I don't think that's a solution that's going to work for us. Even though maybe I would think it was okay. It's not gonna happen. And Australia, they have the biggest coal and gas mines in the world. And they count hydroelectricity that we don't, we don't, we don't count, and it's clean, you know. That means water that comes out of a dam and makes electricity, it's clean. And we've already built it, and they count that. So back to, are we going to make our goals? Well, humans are making up these goals, and some of them are just stupid, and some of them are rewarding <laughs> other people, and at the end of the day, some of them are good, and we need to evaluate those all along the way as a community and decide how we can make it work for us. And how we make those choices in America is by having the market drive it and having the cost drive it. Now, I get so mad when I sit in these, these committees, they go, well, we're going to send a price signal out to everybody so they will quit whatever bad behavior we think is bad this week because somebody's going to make money off of it. I hear that every single day up there. And I'm an educator, and it kills me. It kills me. But we have to make those choices based on the market. We have to support the market. And as long as we do that, and as long as people can bring the market down, it'll work. Now, there's a whole bunch of technological problems that we have to fix. And going back to your question, and I'm going to be done. Sorry. I, I told my husband before I left, I promised him I was not going to get overly involved in this, and I was not going to vent, and I was not going to say what I really thought, because somebody would probably shoot me. Because I was born here, and I am like, you know, educated from BC, and you know, I just can't help it. But, but technology, like the grid, isn't a huge problem. I love electricity, and I'm going to use electricity, and I probably have a hybrid car. If you check me out, I probably do. I just don't know. I'm not really not sure. We'll take a look. All right, because um, now the, the gas models go so efficiently, how would you know what it was? And I don't care. I just look at how much I get mile per hour, you know? because I'm driving back and forth to Sacramento, and I'd go broke on the salary trying to drive back and forth if I, if I didn't look at those things. But the grid is in huge trouble. The grid has to be completely overhauled in order for it to really work well for us. And we're going to do it, and I think we'll get there. But if they said tomorrow that we have to go completely on electricity from the grid, most of us would have to move out of state. We already have one, our, our, our residential electric price is already about 1.5 times higher than other competing states, all the other competing states. So the grid has to become interactive. That's how it has to become, okay? And right now, you know, it's like the big flow that pushes everything through. But because we have rooftop solar and all those other things now, it has to be interactive. It has to know how much is in here and how much is in here and not have to keep the whole thing full all the time. Okay, so that's a problem. We got we to fix. And there's this whole thing. If you're going to electrify the train, the high speed rail train, you got to put like electricity all the way down the valley, big electricity, and somebody, something's got to feed it electricity. That's this grid. 
uh, well, we haven't solved that problem yet either, but we're building the train, so it's not going to be electrified yet. So, okay, we'll, we'll get it. But how much is it going to cost because we're forcing this to happen through a bureaucratic rule that somebody came up with just because they thought it was a good idea that day or some friend of theirs got some money uh, instead of the market actually having a good business plan that does it. And, and I could go on and on and on, and that's, that's the crux of technology. Yes. We are way farther ahead than we ever thought we would be in many areas, and California will continue to do that because we're awesome, and because our university system is good, and because I worked hard to educate all of our children. But <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure if we are using the right means to get the technology to the place. Thank you. So, um, Dean, I just wanted to, before I go to the audience, uh, just to come back to what we're looking at this rapid change. We're going through a transition economically, lifestyle-wise. What does that look like to people? What should they be looking for? How is this going to affect them? You mean in terms of the <coughs> your question again? Uh, just looking at the, this rapid change in ter that we're seeing in terms of renewables, in terms of electrifi electrification, um, and the economic changes, the lifestyle changes. How would you describe how to uh, somebody in California, how their lives are going to change? What does it mean for them? That's a good question. Um, since you're going to be doing audience uh, <coughs> questions and we're in Bakersfield, could I speak all the way to the ends? Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Joking. Good try, good try. Very opinionated, folks. Uh, no, I actually think, you know, obviously our lives have changed very, very much since uh, technology does that, right? So whether you've got a cell phone in your pocket today that actually has more capability, I think, than the lunar module landed on the moon. I think that's the correct deal. Uh, things change very quickly and in bounds, and I think in 20 years, it's very difficult for us to kind of look forward. Our lives have already changed, and I think we're already feeling the effects in some sense of what's to come. But I think as we've trans, let's use renewables for a moment. You know, um, does anyone actually, did anybody know here, when you turn your light on, that pg e had already hit 33% renewables? Okay, so you know, I think we're gonna transition into the new energy <coughs> frontier very seamlessly for consumers. And I think if you think about it, uh, we're not gonna see it by the time we turn the light on. It's just gonna actually happen in some sense in the background. I will say that consumers, part of the reaching our goals, particularly on the carbon side and on the climate side, <laughs> is that we do have to change our, our habits. I think, I think uh, Senator Fuller said it correctly. I think there's an, an issue of what we do. There's efficiencies. Those are important, you know, and I think that there's also behavior. That's important. And then I think there's technology, and that also helps us kind of move this forward. I will say that we're always going to have goals. I mean, um, we're in Bakersfield, uh, home of the Bakersfield drillers. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, my good friend, who is our, our leader in Congress, is a graduate from Bakersfield High School. Uh, how boring, and Bakersfield High School is football because of Frank Gifford, but, but if you think about how boring a football game would it be if we just stopped on the 20-yard line. You know, we continually move the goal. We continually move the flags. We continually move the post because at some point we have a goal of reaching something that is going to be absolutely wonderful, uh, to use Donald Trump, could, beautiful. <laughs> it's going to work beautifully. Trust me. But, but... No, but seriously, it's, uh, we're moving these goals, and people get very nervous about them, and I understand the, the need to have some sense that we have to finish one goal before we move to the other, but we're rapidly reaching these goals so quickly that we continually need to move the goals. When the governor moved the goal in state of state in 2015 and said we need to be at 50% renewables, we need to be at 50% uh, petroleum reduction, you know, it, it's as though, and then it was codified in uh, Senator DeLeon's bill 350, it was almost as though you know, the world was going to end. I, I felt that when we did AB 32. Uh, I wrote about this because I felt that we were at that same point. And I guarantee you, as we continue to move the goal lines to the, to, if you will, the touchdown, the score is really a place where everybody's energy is lower, their efficiency is better, their lives are better, more importantly, their health is better. The health issues we have not talked about in terms of all of these changes, you know, 80, billion dollars worth, the American Lung Association says, plus of health benefits when we move to these changes. You know, that saves a lot of work time, it saves a lot of premature deaths, it saves a lot of heart attacks, 
you know, the end result of pollution is always in making pollution, uh, kind of eliminating that with better fuels and, and, and better methods is actually going to be a real big positive. I think one of the things we're going to see, hopefully, when we're done with this from an average everyday person is a much more healthier place to live. And given that we're in Kern County, I think that's super, super important given our asthma rates, given where we're at. Um, I, I will say that one of the things that all the panelists agree on, and I, and I think Gene's hit, is it is a transition. It's a, it, it, seems, it, it, it seems bumpy, but I think in the way that we leap now in technology, it, it, it happens very rapidly. You know, I, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Edison created the grid 100 years ago. It's made for one thing, it's to send energy out. Okay, we have a grid today that wants energy to come in and out and communicate and send back and we have smart meters, PG&E. Uh, we have all of these things that now are making our grid more efficient, but that really wasn't what it was made for. So it's going to be a little choppy. It's going to be a little different. The grid wasn't created 100 years ago to do what we want it to do today. All of these changes, I think, will take some sense of, the P, particularly the, the uh, CARB, is really kind of be working to try to make those you know, more of a, of a plus and a more of a seamless way for consumers. Yeah. I thought I heard you say smart meters make our grid more efficient. So I just yeah, I said that. So I, I appreciate that. So thank you, Dave. You can, you can put that on a frame. All right. <laughs> Good. Well, I, I really do want to get some questions from the audience. And we have a microphone over here. So if there are questions, um, please, if you could give your name and if you have an affiliation you could share with us, that would be appreciated. So any questions from the audience? Right here. Hi, I'm David Wolf, and we're coming up into summertime. Uh, two summers ago, we had a number of brownouts. Seems like last summer we didn't have that problem. You've mentioned the grid. We've mentioned uh, electrical. What's the what's this summer looking like for short term? Just out of curiosity. Take it. That's for Todd. <laughs> I was thinking Todd, but sure. Gene also mentioned the the grid. So either one, anybody. Uh, actually, our uh, summer forecast usually comes out around May after the uh, hydro precipitation season. Uh, kind of ends uh, early March, a little bit too soon. Uh, but I do note that it really helps uh, the El Nino year. Unfortunately, it hasn't been quite as wet as some people had forecasted, uh, but still hydro is a little bit better than average and typical. Um, and that goes a long way towards keeping energy costs lower um, in terms of capacity uh, and, ha and having meeting peak capacity. A lot of renewables coming online. So actually, it turns out, like at noon, in the summer, there's likely to be an excess of electricity on the grid. Hmm. Okay, for, and you know it's known as the duck chart. I have a uh, you can get an app from the California Independent System Operator called ISO Today, uh, and you can see in the middle of the day actually there's plenty of electricity. Even you know it's a little bit later in the day, around six, seven, eight p.m. in the summer when you still have uh, lots of air conditioning and lots of load. People go home, turn on their lights. Um, and then, you know, the sun isn't quite so strong then, and the wind may not have picked up. So actually, that tends to be the challenge, less so than just simply meeting the, the peak load, which is a bit earlier in the day. Um, and so to, to see what that duck chart will look like for the summer, I don't know quite yet. Well, let's check back in in another month or two. Good. Thank you. I'd love to yeah. comment on that briefly. Um, there are spots around the state that are in worse shape than others. So to ask one company uh, doesn't give you the whole picture. So um, the, uh, the nuclear plant that was shut down on the, you know, in San Diego, just outside of San Diego, maybe some of you don't know, caused a, a problem because there's a chokehold in the distribution system on the grid that goes to San Diego. And so now they are trying to figure out how they're going to make sure they don't have brownouts throughout Los Angeles from the Aliso Canyon gas leak. Yeah. And they also have a chokehold that they're trying to figure out how they can put enough electricity to San Diego to stop brownouts. Because these are uncontrollable brownouts. Some of our brownouts, you know, in Bakersfield, they were kind of controllable because other people were getting off, were paid to get off the grid if, if you went into a brownout, so eventually you get it back up. But these are no technological uh, solution to them, and they're, they're sort of ongoing. So if you are in LA, the truth is, is that if Aliso Canyon doesn't, 
If we don't, there's no technological solution yet developed that will make this work in a timely way. But if that doesn't work, there are going to be brownouts in LA. Now, you can put up peaker plants and other things. I just make sure, Gene, I heard you say basically Bakersfield would be better off this summer than LA in terms of having electricity. Yes, so that's all right. right. And <laughs> and peaker plants can help, but peaker plants are fossil fuel in most cases. Yeah. And a lot of communities don't want them. In San Diego, they voted against the old peaker plants that they mothballed, putting them back in to get them through the time. So they just don't they don't have a solution because it's a kind of a political problem as well as a chokehold. In Alicio Canyon, it's because there's high pressure gas, uh, which is not the oil companies at all. <laughs> this is a, a whole nother deal. High pressure gas storage being put in there and they have no way to like cap it off without it having other problems start out. So it is an old, it is an old grid. It is an old highway system. It is an old dam system. This is California. We have ridden on the backs of our wonderful World War II parents who, who made America better and, and were willing to give to fix those kind of infrastructure programs. Now we got to figure it out. We do have Thank new you. technology, but around the state, if you move, it's going to be harder. Well, I'm glad you Thanks. brought that up, Gene, that uh, San Diego uh, is, uh, uh, doesn't, is not interested in peaker plants. And I think it's important for people of Bakersfield to understand that San Diego passed a climate action plan. Now, San Diego, that's a Republican uh, council. It's a Republican mayor. They unanimous, unanimously passed a climate action plan that included moving to 100% renewable energy. And in San Diego, that wasn't buying renewable energy from Wyoming. That was making renewable energy in their own community that they would own themselves. And while we're at it, Lancaster. Now, San Diego's rather wealthy community, we all know that, and Bakersfield's not quite as wealthy as San Diego, though, of course, we have good quality of life here, too. Lancaster, California, Republican City Council, Republican Mayor, Rex Paris uh, is quite, quite an impressive political figure in California. I think we're gonna see more of him they have a policy net zero by 2020. That is, they will produce all of their own electricity by 2020 with renewables in their community that they own. And, and that's what San Diego could do to avoid that problem that Southern California Edison, not our friends at PG&E, Southern California Edison caused by this mismanagement of a nuclear power plant that they are trying to put the cost of their disastrous management on the ratepayers of California through our corrupt public utility commission. So I hope Gene can take some action on that with Governor Brown. Well, and I just I have to say that local control though is the key. Yeah. That's the key. What communities can do and and what they want to change their behaviors. That's that's what that's how we have to get there. Thank you. Let's uh, get to another question. We have another question over here. Hi, my uh, name's Mike Warren. Uh, one thing you don't hear much about is CO2 capture and storage. Uh, I wonder if perhaps Dean could, could comment on that from the little bit of research I've done. It does seem like there's, there's definitely some cost hurdles, but I'm just wondering if those were overcome, could it be a material uh, help? I'll, I'll chime in too. Okay, I'm not sure I don't want Kathy to go first on that, but uh, <laughs> uh, either one of you. But I'll start. Uh, you, you know, in terms of carbon capture, I mean, I think it is uh, obviously uh, as we watch some of the debate uh, among the Supreme Court and its kind of stay of the uh, the Obama clean energy or what is the CCA? What is the the term clean? The clean power plant. Power, yeah, yeah power plant. Clean power Sorry, plant. thank you, Kathy. You know, I, I think uh, we watch these debates over the capture versus kind of going the other way, really kind of carbon free. I, I, th I, th I think it is something that um, continues to, to need discussion. I think California, uh, it probably is not, my guess is not moving in, in a direction of just trying to have these capture types of things. I think we really like to move to better, better types of alternatives and technologies. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, I, when I think of carbon, I always think of like things that people don't think about, maybe like the sea. It actually is, you know, at 95% or so of kind of the carbon in the world. It's, there are things that we still have to learn, and, but I would probably say that my view of it is that uh, carbon capture is probably not high on my, my agenda, at least. Kathy? So I think it's a remarkably wonderful technology. Uh, we spent, we spent, as assigned by the governor and legislature, we were put on a blue ribbon committee to study this, and we did, and everyone was on this, including our friends at NRDC and the environmental community. We came up with an agreement on how wonderful this technology could be for a transitionary period because we are taking carbon from entering the atmosphere and we're putting it underground and putting it to beneficial use so that the carbon stays underground and we can we can have a tradition, you know, a sort of a pathway forward. It's stated in the scoping plan of AB32 as a technology. The Air Resources Board is now holding workshops on this very point. And the concern that the Air Resources Board has and wants to make sure they, um, uh, and we agree with, is to make sure that we can account for those emissions staying in the ground. So there's not leakage. That's a, that's a good thing. That's a yeah. protocol issue. But it's a recognition that that is a good technology to deal with climate change and CO2 emissions going to the atmosphere. So that's, I think it's wonderful. I wished we would get on with it because we've been working on it for seven years. <laughs> and Todd, you had a Sure, on so that? I just wanted to point out, I think Gene, you mentioned high heating valve fuels earlier. Um, for most of the United States, which still generates electricity using a lot of coal, it makes a lot of sense economically to try to capture the carbon from burning the coal and store it. Now, California, in PG doesn't have any electricity uh, burned from coal. California has very little. It's mostly imported. Uh, it's, almost, it's actually practically illegal to have a long-term contract with a coal burning power plant in California right now. Uh, it was another, it wasn't AB32, it was, SB was it 1368, okay? And so actually for much of the country, it makes a lot of economic sense and promise. For California, maybe not so much because natural gas has far less carbon content in terms of emissions than coal does. Uh, and so is it promising for California? It depends as we go forward to see exactly how much it might cost and what the alternatives might be. The HECA project tried to do it in Bakersfield for a very long time unsuccessfully because there wasn't the leadership in California to allow that to happen. It's a great technology and I, I thought we really cared about any emissions that go into the atmosphere that relate to carbon and this is certainly a good one to look at and pursue. Did we blame that on PG&E? Didn't they no, not give them a no, contract? I'm not blaming it on anyone. I'm just oh, saying no, it's a great okay. technology that needs to be pursued. Good. All right, we do have different perspectives here. Um, and other, other questions right here? Ben Lubon, I'm, I'm a climate capitalist. Um, <laughs> what is a climate capitalist? Someone who knows the solutions that you're speaking of and how we can make lots more money and create more jobs. Oh, love and that. capture and, and sequestration is the bane of my existence. Because <laughs> it doesn't make sense to put something in the ground. But capture and reutilization. See, one man's waste is another man's treasure. What's coming out of your refinery? So what's come, the methane that's coming out of your power plants or the coal? We can actually make clean coal, you know. We can reclaim the water. We can capture the emissions. And with those affluents, we can grow algae and, and green crude and mix it at the, at the refinery. But it's yeah, reutilization. Is, yeah, is who's aware of this? Who's aware of your reutilization? I'm sorry, I'm a lobbyist. I need to okay. educate. <laughs> when I hear something right there that, you know, we want sequestration. We need reutilization, so please. Well, the oil industry it. had, of course, proposed to use sequestration to to uh, use it for extraction, and that was the plan in uh, Saskatchewan, which has led to an enormous boondoggle in the province of Saskatchewan in their CCS plant, which is probably going to lead to the fall of the government. Now, if that's what's being proposed for California, well, I say good luck. 
Yeah, that's exactly what I proposed, Paul. Thank you for restating that so clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just offer if you, your point about reuse and using waste in particular. The standard technology now for, for gas-fired power plants is actually a combined cycle power plant. And combined what? Uses a simple cycle peaker yeah, and basically yeah, yeah. uses the waste heat and gets more electricity out of it. And so that idea is proven technology, and it's the standard in natural gas-fired power plants. And so lots of great promising ideas to do that, and I look forward to hearing what else you may offer in the decades to come. Good. Another question right here. Yeah, Tom Franz, uh, Shafter Farmer. Um, of course, HECO just withdrew their application today, so it's not going to happen. And that's very good news for us here in Kern County. But Mr. Strauss, can you assure me that I will never again, as you plan for 2050, and doubling your capacity and it, making it 100% renewable, will I ever have to go to the CEC again, California Energy Commission, to uh, fight against a new fossil fuel power plant here in the San Joaquin Valley? Is that and age over? And so, can I assure anyone of anything going to 2050? I assure you, I cannot assure anyone of anything going to 2050. <laughs> but you look to see natural gas-fired power plants, fossil fuel-fired power plants. What do we need them for, okay? When you look out towards 2020, 2030, and 2050, they're not likely to be running max out. They're not likely, we don't need them to be running in the middle of the day. Because even though we've got the air conditioners, we have lots of solar panels. So we actually might need some fossil fired power plants to go up a little bit around 6 or 7 p.m. and turn off at 10 p.m. We might need them a little bit to turn on at 5 p.m. and then turn off at 8, uh, turn, turn on at 5 a.m. and turn off at 8 a.m. when the sun comes up. So unless we find a storage technology that can replace it, it might be more cost effective, unless we can widen perhaps the, the market and get some of our neighbors, uh, some who might be in slightly different time zones, slightly different climates, uh, unless we can get some demand response so people might uh, reduce or increase their electricity use according to market price signals, um, we might actually need some of the existing power plants to operate a little bit differently. The future, no one is planning at this moment for lots of additional gas-fired power plants, but you never know, and so they're likely to be operated quite differently from what we've seen to date. So don't know if that's reassuring to you, um, but uh, that's the nature of the future. Uh, I think we have time for Jim Scott, two 17 more. News. Um, stored hydro is one example of storing renewable energy, pumping the water back up the hill, let it come down through the turbine. But isn't it true that to realize the full potential of renewable energy anywhere, you have to have a discussion about energy storage for renewable energy. Is anybody having that conversation in the halls of the legislature or Congress to aggressively pursue that re, uh, stored storage for renewable energy in order to unleash the full potential of renewable energy? Absol absolutely. I mean, California is again leading the way. It is the largest battery storage market in the world for electricity right now. There's actually a state mandate, uh, was it AB 2514, uh, that has become policy, and there's a target pg &E has to get 580 megawatts of uh, innovative storage uh, on the transmission system, distribution system, behind the meter by 2020 to be in place by 2024. And the intent is to enable the integration of renewables, but also California style, what's the intent? To transform the market okay, and show the way that this could be done worldwide and to enable California jobs and California technology to be exported. So it's happening. Yeah, uh, Jim, I would like to follow up on that. Um, <clears throat> we actually have quite a bit of storage in California now, particularly when PG&E closes the other reactor, the reactors at Diablo Canyon. Uh, we'll have a lot of pump storage available that we can use for renewables. And when Southern California Edison, of course, now that their, their reactors are offline because of their mismanagement, we have all their um, pump storage available for renewables in the state. 
I don't think we need a lot of storage. Most of the academic studies done now, most of the engineering work done now, and I think uh, Todd was referring to this in terms of the scale that you see for storage, is that most of the thinking now is when you go to very high penetrations of renewable energy, such as I've been talking about, you don't need as much storage. Now, you may need 3% of fossil fuels, uh, Kathy's natural gas, uh, simple cycle, not, comp not, not um, multiple cycle, simple cycle gas, uh, gas plants, you know, very expensive, but you only run them a few hours a year, so who cares? Uh, that's where most of the thinking is now, that you don't need as much storage as we thought. But the, the key is, and the key for you here in Bakersfield, the key for Senator Fuller and others, is you have to have a renewable energy policy. We don't have that in California. We don't have a renewable energy policy. We have an RPS, these acronyms that you were talking about, David. But we don't have a renewable energy policy because a renewable energy policy has to get you a mix of resources, just like PG&E and Edison and DWP and all these utilities had a mix of resources. They didn't have all coal. They didn't have all hydro. They didn't have all gas. They had a mix of coal, a mix of oil, a mix of hydro. And that's what we need with renewables. We need the geothermal we have in Kern County. We're not even developing geothermal in this state anymore. We need the biomass plants. We're closing the biomass plants instead of opening new ones. We need biogas plants. We've got all those cows out there with all that manure just polluting the environment. And I hope Dean can do something about that, making that generation of electricity with all that manure instead of breathing it when you're on a train. So we need a renewable energy policy in this state so that we have all those renewables and so it's the mix that's critical. It's that mix. And this is where we need people like Todd and others who are analyzing the details of how you do that. Thank Whether 60% wind, 30% so solar, you need a mix question. of resources. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just weigh in what actually yeah. goes on that I've heard Thank in the you. halls of the Senate? <laughs> okay. Um, number one, absolutely that is the, the key component. And there will have to be more breakthroughs and discussions on that. So far, the failed discussion, work, it's not anybody's fault it failed, I'm not blaming them, I'm just saying it happened and it failed. And that was uh, to get Tesla's batteries uh, up because they're doing these long-term batteries that they put under the cars and then you change them out and they're huge. And they kind of fell apart when they decided to go to Reno because it was cheaper to make them in Reno. So they're making them in Reno now. So uh, we don't we don't talk about that now. Okay. So then the next thing was um, that um, we the duck chart's been coming around from the CPUC and they've been sharing that with us because the bottom line is is everybody's really afraid of the excess daytime energy, not not off peak for renewables, but excess daytime energy and when the wind blows energy. Um, and they're talking about, they sell it off currently to other states for way less than the cost of producing it because they haven't figured out a way to store it. And so that's a, that's a huge cost to everybody. And other states who don't even have goals uh, are getting the benefit of what we all paid to generate this stuff. So that is a, a policy problem. And the last is that, so I looked up where, who was actually doing this. And Texas, under Governor Perry, was um, researching batteries and doing it under a, uh, like a GoBiz program that we have there. And uh, after I saw what they were doing, I was, I was thinking we weren't ahead of anything. So anyway. So uh, we're, we're into overtime here. Well, but let, so me, let me go back to <laughs> Senator Fuller's, uh, Fuller's comment, because I think it's pertinent. She, she, she lamented the loss of the Tesla plant. And I think we should lament the loss of the Tesla plant in California. That was a big mistake, letting that plant go to, uh, go to uh, Nevada. But we have an opportunity to do something even bigger. And that is, you all remember what happened with Volkswagen. They cheated on our emission standards in the United States. 35 times the emissions were emitted from the diesel engines of Volkswagen. They were caught with their pants down. So what's the penalty they're going to pay? Well, I'm suggesting. And now it's being rumored in Germany that EPA, and I hope CARB, mm -hmm. will be insisting that to make amends, Volkswagen will have to build an electric vehicle plant in the United States. And I ask Senator Fuller, and I ask CARB, and I would ask 
Barack Obama and the EPA to ensure that that plant is built where the market for electric cars exists today, and that's in California, and I suggest we build it in Bakersfield. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to end on a high note. Uh, okay, Todd, a quick comment. I just want to add something there, because uh, you mentioned Texas, and you know, the reality is we learn from everybody. Just note there's a program in Texas to give away electricity for free at night because they have plenty of wind power at night in West Texas, and it doesn't cost anything to generate that electricity, and so they give it away for free. And so it's like, we might think about that because actually the wholesale price in California of electricity is sometimes negative, that is you pay to generate in the middle of the day. And so we need to think pretty differently about the future and even the present from what the past was. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you all for coming. And please the, join me in giving a big hand to this panel. Available to us. Thank you, John. It was good to have you up here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. You're we'll see you later. Thank you, too. Uh, you had a, you'll have an easier job than Mary will next week. Thanks again to Dave Lesher for, uh, uh, and Cal Matters for hosting this and moderating the uh, event today. Thank you, Dave. Hydrogen is a really bad choice.